I was thinking about what, what it is that Word of Faith is about, because I was listening to, uh, I was talking, I talked to two, two people from um, two very good churches here in, in, in our bay, in, in Kabecha, and I was wondering, I was thinking about what we preach about, what we believe. Um, now, let me be clear that when I'm speaking about these, these churches, uh, this is not a criticism, this is encouragement, they're good churches. The one, the, one, um, the one lady was telling me she's now running a ministry in 17 countries, and it came directly from what her pastor was preaching. And so, one of the things I've learned as I've been here for the last few years, it's nearly two years, is to what extent what we preach is produced in people's lives. And so I was thinking, what is it that word of faith, what is it that we do? And I think that what, what we do is that we preach a supernatural worldview. It comes from our, our founder, Pastor Jimmy and Mariana. But we believe that, that, that there's a, that we believe strongly in the supernatural, and we give you the tools and the equipment to, to, and, the, and the understanding to really take, to, 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 to move in the supernatural. You see, one of the reasons I was talking to my son a few days ago, and we were talking about the supernatural, and I think that if you look around our world, if you don't have a strong supernatural worldview, then there are a lot of things that don't make sense. There are a lot of things around you, a lot of things that happen, a lot of things that, that, um, that are a certain way. And if you don't understand that there's a supernatural realm, then, that, then there's, it's not going to make sense to you. So we preach faith, but it's, I think it's important that we give you a framework against which your faith can be pushed. So I say, have faith. So, so I can be like George Michael and say, you've got to have faith. But faith in what? I think, that, I think that too often we think faith is blind, but it isn't blind. I think you have to have a good, strong framework, understanding. And then you need to take that and believe it. And if you don't believe it, you know, if you, then you have to make a choice. Do I believe the in the supernatural realm, or don't I? So for instance, we launched NMB Belongs to Jesus. And um, I, I sat up till half past one, watching the city council, there was some disgusting behavior. They tried to steal the ballot box at one stage and there was a big fight over it and people behaved so appallingly. But, but the bottom line is, I believe there was a change of government and because we launched this campaign. Because as soon as you make that declaration that NMB, your city, belongs to Jesus, as soon as you do that, then God looks down and says, well, is this person in charge of the city doing what I want him to do or her to do in my city? Now, I'm not saying that that, that the current government is God's people. What I'm saying is, is that if God, if, if, if these, this current lot don't run the city properly, I think God will remove them because it, we've now declared that it's his city and they are now no longer looking after themselves. They are now stewards of God's city. And if they're not good stewards, God will remove them. And so, so something that's really exciting is that one of our pastors, um, Lance Grootboom, is going to be in charge of electricity in our city. And, and one of the interesting things is that very recently they changed the law so that municipalities can pr procure electricity. Now, this is very early days. 
But can you believe with me that God supernaturally intervenes, that NMB can get enough electricity that we can end load shedding? Lord has already given me an idea, and we, we're looking into it, to find a way to reduce load shedding. There's, there, there seems to be some low-hanging fruit that we can easily access extra electricity. Why? Because God is light and there's no darkness in him. If, he, if, if a city belongs to him, it's not going to stay in the dark very long. We believe, and that's what I'm trying to speak to you about. I'm trying to show you that, 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 that we believe that there's a supernatural God, that he's not sitting there pie in the sky far away. We believe that he can intervene. He can intervene and change your life. He can in intervene and change your family. He can intervene and change your health. He can intervene and change your, your finances. He can intervene and change your business. He can intervene and change your city, and he can intervene and change your country. And, and, so, and so we have the audacity to believe that God can change our city, that he can reduce the crime, that he can end load shedding, that he can transform it into a clean city. And so I want us not, because a lot of people, I think in, we, we, we've made the mistake in the past of thinking, oh, we did that and moved on. And I want us to push this change all the way, that our city, that jobs come, that poverty is broken. And that if anyone gets in the way of that, God will remove him. God already gave us a word that people would be removed and they were removed. I'm talking about two, two years ago, God said he was going to take someone, and he did. Because we are not a political church, we are a church that believes that God is, that, that we need to give God the city to him, and he's going to sort things out. And so, and so, the other thing that we believe and we preach here at Word of Faith is that you can have an intimate, personal relationship with God. You can experience God. That you, a lot of churches preach that you can experience God through the Bible. And last week, what did I preach? That you can experience God through the Bible. By reading the Bible, by that ch changing you. But even then... That isn't the only way that God interacts with you. He meets you where you are. And so what I want to do today is I want to preach to you about how to experience a deeper level of God. And so let's have a look. Um, now, <coughs> one of the great prophets was a guy called Moses. And Moses Moses stepped up and he, and he said, I'm going, to, I'm going to put my life up for the sake of, for the sake of, my, of my people. Because God had said, I've had enough of these stiff-necked people. I don't, want to, I don't want to have anything to do with them. And so in, in, in Exodus 33, verse 15 to 18, he says, for Moses had said, if you aren't going with us, don't let us move a step from this place. And we would, we would say the same. More and more I've been realizing that God's up to stuff and that instead of me telling him what my plans are, I need to find out what his plans are and fit in. The Lord's been speaking to me about that more and more and more. And so he says, don't let us move a step from this place. If you don't go with, with us, who will ever know? that I and my people have found favor with you and that, you are, that we are different from any other people upon the face of the earth. So what makes us different is the presence of the Lord in our lives. How is anyone going to know? There are people that are very generous Muslims and Hindus and atheists. Some of them aren't. But the point is, what sets you apart as a person is the presence of the Lord. How will anybody know that you are a child of God? How will you ever know, anyone know, that you are God's child unless he goes with you? 
And so, and that we are different from other people upon the face of the earth. And the Lord replied to Moses, yes, I will do what you've asked, for you have certainly found favor with me, and you are my friend. So Abraham, sorry, Abraham, Moses says to God, I want your presence to be with me, and God replies, you are my friend. So we have a level of presence of God, and then God says friend. But I want to take you to the highest level of connection and relationship to God. Let's have a look at it, what it is. Then Moses asked to see God's glory. The highest level of any relationship you can have with God is if you experience his glory. And that's, what, that's the level that all of us should aspire to, is to experience his glory. A lot of you are now looking at me saying, what is that? It sounds great, but what is his glory? And so let's have a look at what his glory is. And the word there is kabod. And what it means is glorious, duh, but it also means glory, honor, glorious, abundance, abundance, riches, honor, splendor, glory, dignity, reputation, reverence, glory. Does that help you a lot? But really what kabod is, is it's the king had the, always had the fanciest set of armor. A beautiful set of armor that they would have done out of metalwork. That's, they were in the Bronze Age back then, or sort of. Um, and, so, and so what they did was, was they would build these beautiful, intricate sets of armor for the king. In fact, Saul tried to put his glory, his kabod, his heavy armor onto David, and David said, I don't want your heavy armor. I don't want that. I have something else. And so, kabod is God's heavy armor. It's the best way to, to understand it is that there's the presence of God and then there is the heavy presence of God. And some of you have said that, say, I experience God in my life, but just sometimes there's a heavy presence of God where you can just feel his presence. It becomes real and it's, it tends to happen in church meetings every once in a while. It, it happens elsewhere. When, the, when, the glow, when, the pres, when people really worship and open their hearts out and they let go of their inhibitions, and the glory comes in you. I remember, I remember the, uh, um, for instance, many years ago I was in a meeting with Rodney Howard Brown here in this church and the glory came down and people started to supernaturally give. They brought stuff forward and eventually people drove home and bought, brought their surfboards. And, but that, that night there was like a mist, there was like a, there was like a thickness in the room and that was, that, that was the glory of God and it transformed people. It changed people forever. Not only did people give generously to the church. I know of one person who was really battling with finances who received thousands of rands that night. It was the product of the heavy presence of God. The glory of God filled the room. So how do you, who here would love to experience that heavy, intense presence of God where the room is filled with the presence of God and there's, you can almost, it's an expression, but you, you can cut it with a knife. It's so thick. And you experience God in his fullness, just like Moses had. Show me your glory. You can do, we can do the same. How do we do that? Who wants to experience this heavy presence of God? And so I want to show you how to do that. And to do that, we need to go back to the, the plans for the temple. And it says in 1 Chronicles 28 verse 11, it says, Then David gave Solomon his son the plans of the vestibule for the temple and of its houses, its treasuries, its, its inner rooms, and its inner chambers, and of the room for the mercy seat. So David told 
Solomon exactly what the temple should look like. And it was planned in minute detail. Now, the key to experiencing the, the glory is in this scripture. And I'm going to read it to you. Also, his plan, this is Chronicles 28, verses um, 18 to 19. Also, his plan for the golden chariot of the cherubim that spread their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. All this he made clear to me in writing from the hand of the Lord, or the work to be done according to the plan. Do you see the key there? All of you are looking at me blankly. I don't blame you. It's not obvious, is it? What is, what is the key there? What is the key there? The key there is the chariot. There was a chariot in the temple. Do you see that? And he's planned for the golden chariot of the cherubim. The key to experiencing the glory is the golden chariot of the ch cherubim. Say, so, well, what has that got to do with anything? Why was there a chariot in the temple? How does that have anything to do with us experience the, the powerful, real, overwhelming presence of God? Glad you asked. Because this is important, and I want you, I, I'm going to show you why it's so important. So it says, then the priests, so this is at the end of, of, this is when they've built the temple now. What does it say? When the priests, the priests withdrew the, from the holy place, they just finished everything, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord and the priests could not perform their service because the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The reason the glory of the Lord filled the temple is because there was a chariot. Do you guys know why? Well, let's keep going then. So, let's first talk about the temple. So, where does God live? In, um, Stephen, in his, message, his sermon, he quotes from, the, uh, I think it's Isaiah, and he says, However, God doesn't live in temples made by human hands. He says, The heaven is my throne, says the Lord, through his prophets, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of home could you build, asked the Lord? Could I stay in it? Didn't I even make heaven and earth? So God says, what sort of home can you build for me, and could I stay in it? So what does a temple need to be? It needs to be a home for the Lord that he can stay in. And um, I'm going to read you the scripture, but the last line is the most important. For Christ has entered into heaven itself to appear now before God as our friend. It is not in the earthly place of worship that he did this, for that was merely a copy of the real temple in heaven. So what did, David, what did Solomon build and what did David tell him to build? They made a copy of the temple in heaven. So what we, can, what we know from that is that there is a, Chariot in the temple in heaven. What's, what's a chariot got to do with? So let's keep going then. So um, Hebrews 8 verse 1 to 2. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor besides the throne of the majestic God in heaven. So <clears throat> in the temple... God sits on a throne, and Jesus sits next to him. There he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, in the heavenly temple. The true place of worship that was built by the Lord, not by human hands. So we see that, that, that God built a temple, and there's a throne there that he sits on, and Jesus sits next to him. 
I think this will help you. So then Daniel gets a, gets a vision of the temple. He gets an insight into the most holy place, into the temple in heaven. And let's see what he says. Sees. I watched as thrones were put in place, and the ancient one, God the Father, sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with, with wheels of blazing fire. What does a chariot have? What makes it a chariot? Wheels. A chariot has wheels. A chariot has wheels. So God sits on a throne that's actually a chariot. So when they were building the throne in the in, in when they were building the wheel, the chariot in the in the temple, what they were really doing is they were building a throne for God to sit on in the temple. And when he came on the throne, guess what happens? The glory fills the temple. Let's have a look. I'm going to take you to Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel had an incredible vision. A lot of, lot of people claim that, that he was, um, some of the, the, the more secular Scholars claim that he was on some, he was high or taken LSD. But when you, when you really read his vision of what he saw, and you connect, it, it is so interconnected with every other book in the Bible. It's remarkable. It's one of the most remarkable piece pages in the whole, in the whole Bible. <coughs> and it says in Ezekiel 1 verse 1, on July 31st of my 30th year, while I was with the Judean exiles besides the Kibar River in Babylon. Now, what he's telling you here is that he's in captivity. He lived, he was from Israel. He's probably from Jerusalem. But he had been taken captive by, he had been taken captive by the enemy. And they transported him back to their land and they were holding him captive there. And he was probably at the river Kiba because he was having to work. Forced labor. I saw a photo. I don't know if you remember the guys that were taken captive from Mariupol, the Ukrainians. I saw a picture of the commander now that he's back from Russia. And he, he looks emaciated. He looks like he's been in a concentration camp. And so Ezekiel gets this vision in the lowest of low position that he, that he could just about have. What happens is he's sitting next to the river, probably in despair, and the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And so he saw into the supernatural realm and he saw God and let's see, let's see what happens. He says, this is in verse 4, And as I looked, I saw a great storm coming from the north, driving to, before a huge cloud that flashed with lightning and shone with brilliant light. There was fire inside the cloud, and in the middle of the, the fire glowed something like gleaming amber. Now remember what was in the temple. What, what happened when the glory arrived in the temple? There was a cloud. So literally he's sitting there at the river Kiva on the lowest of low, emaciated, beaten, held captive. And he sees the glory of the Lord coming towards him in the form of a cloud. And then the next, in, in verse 15 to 16, it says, as I stared at all of this, I saw four wheels on the ground beneath them. One wheel belonged to each. The wheels looked as if they were made of polished amber, and each wheel was constructed with a second wheel crosswise. They could go in any of the four directions without having to face around. The four wheels had rims and 
spokes, and the rooms were filled with eyes around the edges. Now, who drives a chariot? God. So God is busy pitching up here. He's seeing. What is he seeing? He's seeing the bottom of the throne. And then in the next, in in, um, Ezekiel 26 to 28, he says, For high in the sky above me there was what looked like a throne made of beautiful blue sapphire stones, and upon it sat someone who appeared to be a man. From his waist up, he seemed to be all glowing bronze, dazzling like fire. And from his waist down, he seemed to be entirely flame. And there was a glowing halo, like a rainbow all around him. What is he seeing? He's now seeing the Father sitting on his throne. And the Father was driving up to him. And wherever the Father went, there was a cloud of glory around Ezekiel was experiencing the glory of God. Do you notice that there's no horses putting this chariot? There's nothing that see, it seems to be a self-propelled chariot. What do you call a self-propelled? What do we call a self-propelled chariot? A car. God was driving his car. Now, literally, his self-propelled throne was coming towards Ezekiel. And what does Ezekiel say about it? He says, that was the way the glory of the Lord appeared to me. The glory of the Lord is what? Is the Father seated on the throne. That's what it looks like. That's what it is. So why is is that the glory of the Lord? Why? What effect does that have? What? And so we we let me explain to you. And the best way is out of Esther one to two. Now, Xerxes was one of the greatest kings to ever emperors ever in in the history of the world. And it says these events happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. So the, the, when you see a throne, what does a throne speak of? It speaks of authority. It speaks of rule. It speaks of kingdom. So when... So when God, God sits on his throne, what does it mean? That he's king. Even though Ezekiel is held captive by this, this terrible power in Babylon, God pitches up sitting on his throne and he drives up to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel experiences the presence of God. What does that mean? It means that you here, sitting here right now, where you are, you can experience the glory of God irrespective of your circumstances. Say, can I experience a deeper level of God? Yes, you can. You can experience the glory of God. You can experience a deeper level of the presence of God in your life. So what do you need to do to experience this deeper level of God? Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 to 17. No longer is there a temple in Jerusalem. I hear they're gonna try and build one, but I don't believe that that's God's plan. So I don't believe his presence is going to arrive there. And do you know why? It says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple for God's temple is holy and you are his temple. They are not going to rebuild the temple and do you know why they're not going to rebuild? Or or if they do, why, 
that isn't God's temple. Do you know why? Because God already has a temple. You're his temple. As we sit here together, you are the temple of God. Say, well, I haven't experienced the glory. Well, have we made a place for God to park his car in our temple? Have we said to God, you are the ruler You are in charge. Come and park your throne in our temple. And I can feel the presence of the Lord as I say this. The presence of the Lord is here. Glory of the Lord is, is, I'm certainly experiencing the glory of the Lord. If we can experience, if we can give God a place to park his his throne, a place to park his car, a place to say, God, you're on the throne here in our temple. Come and rule over us. We make space for you. The reason why the temple had the glory of God is because they had made a space for his chariot. They made a space for his throne. They made a space for him. We as a church, what do do I want more than anything else? I want you to experience the heavy presence of God. The glory of God. But to do that, we have to make a space for God to come and park his, his car here in our temple. We have to say, come. Come here. We welcome you in. We want you. And the the children of Israel, Solomon and David, made a space for, for God. And so we need to do the same thing here. You see, because in John 1 verse 14 to um, verse 23, sorry, John 14 verse 23 to 24, it says, Jesus replied, because I will only reveal myself to those who love me and obey me. The Father will love them too, and we will come to them and live with them. So the Father wants to come and live with us. He wants us to experience his glory. He he wants us to experience his thick, heavy presence. And so anyone who doesn't obey me doesn't love me. And remember, I'm not making up this answer to your question. It is the answer given to me by the Father who sent me. How do you make space for God to come and park his car in your temple? You obey him. You make space for him. You make a parking spot for him in the center of the temple and you say, come and rule and reign here in my life. Let your glory come. I want to experience your heavy presence. I want to experience you in a full, real, powerful way. I want you, I want you today to start to ask the Lord. Let's, let's talk to the Lord. Say, come, come, G, come, Father. Come and park your car in, a, in my garage, in my temple. I want to experience you in a real powerful way. I want to experience your glory. Pray with me. Let your glory come into our church, Father God. We make space for your, your throne, your chariot throne. We put it in the center of our temple, Father. We ask you, Precious Father, in the name of Jesus, to come and manifest in our church. We open it up. We open this church up for you. We invite you in, Lord. Let your glory come into this church. We ask you to help us to obey you. Do what you've called us to do. Let your glory come, Father God. Let your glory come in this temple. 
Start to respond to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Allow him to. What am I doing? I'm speaking in the tongues of men and angels as the Spirit leads me. Come, Jesus. Come, Jesus. Stand up if you need to. Do whatever you need to. Sure. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. As we're just closing the service right now, oh, there's just such a presence of the Lord right now. And um, we just, we'd like to ask you to please comment any prayer needs right now. In fact, you know, just in fact, as we're doing this right now, I feel like led to just, let's first of all, just pray. We're going to have an altar call right now for, as I'm just going to go on to see the comments. The other comments. Thank you, Father. So this morning, if, you, if you're asking the Lord to, to live in your heart, today you might be that person saying, Lord, be on the throne of my heart. Maybe you've never prayed it before. Maybe you've been looking for an opportunity to ask Jesus Christ to sit on that throne of your heart, to bring his presence. You heard Pastor Richard preach now. Isn't that powerful? We are the temple. We have, there, there will be no new temple built because we are the temple of God. And you know what makes you the temple of God is when you allow Jesus Christ to be on that throne of your heart. So this morning, I want to ask you now, if, if you are saying that you want Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to sit on that throne room of your heart, I want to say, yes, that's me. Yes, that's me. In the comments, just go ahead, just say, yes, that's me. Yes, that's me. Yes, that's me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just go ahead and comment. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. If that is you, we're going to pray. And then um, as we're just waiting on anybody right now that wants to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, I want to just say right now, if, if you are needing prayer right now, we want to minister. Myself and Michaela would like to minister. Pray for you if there's a specific need. And maybe there's an area of your life that um, you've given your heart to Jesus, you've given your heart to the Lord, but there's an area of your life that you you want Jesus Christ to take the throne room of, of the, the throne of that area. You know, it can so often happen. There's certain areas I see someone saying, "Yes, that's me." Hallelujah, Merlin. Well done. Um, see, Louis, Louisa, pray for my baby. He's three heart disease as well. Okay, we're gonna pray for that. Louisa, let, come on, amen. Let's, we want to pray for you. We want to minister to you. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I think in the meantime, Michaela, um, I see Austrian West. Yes, that's me. Praise the Lord. And I want to say, Merlin, Austrian, um, anybody who says, yes, that's me, we would like to. We would like to inbox you. We'd like to contact you and, um, and, and refer you to a connect group where you can continue to grow. Continue, continue. I see Lance Poseidon, no, Tajran Khan. Come on now. Thank you, Jesus. Welcome, welcome to all of you. Welcome to all of you in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Loani Butcher saying, glorified God. Amen. To the four of you so far, Merlin, Austrian, Lance, and Tajran, we want to invite, we want to welcome you to the kingdom of God. We're going to pray a prayer with you right now that you can follow. And then we would like, we're going to message you and invite you to one of our connect groups. And I'm going to ask Michaela if you can just pray the, the salvation prayer with him right now. So all those people that said, yes, that's me. Come on. If you want to see Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now, come on. Just say, yes, that's me. We want to pray with you right now. Absolutely. So this morning, I just want us to say that we acknowledge this morning. I want you to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. That He's died on the cross for you and rose again on the third day. So as I'm saying this, just say it at home as well. That you, you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You acknowledge that He died on the cross and He rose again. You believe in your heart and if you confess in your mouth that He is God. He will be God in your life. Thank you. 
being a child of God this morning. So as you say those prayers, just confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, repent of your sins and ask the Holy Spirit to come inside and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. From this day forward is such an important day. Remember the date, remember the moment that you have given your life to God because your life will never be the, the same. I don't believe that is there's any person that can um, experience and encounter God and their lives has to stay the same. I believe that once you've encountered God, things must change. Things have to change. And if you continue to pray and continue to seek God in His kingdom, those changes will come into your life as well. This prayer after me. I'm going to pray a prayer right now with Michaela. You can follow after me. And if, the, if I see already there's somebody on YouTube also saying, yes, that's me. Isn't this powerful, guys? So awesome. This is so beautiful. Yeah. People responding to Jesus Christ this morning. This that's is amazing. Incredible. We're going to pray the salvation prayer and then we're going to continue to pray for different needs. Luisha, we're going to pray for your child. We're going to pray for uh, every, every single one of you for the Lord to really be seated on the Amen. throne of, the, of those areas, of every area of your life. Amen. So just pray this after me. Father God, thank you that you have forgiven me of every sin, of every iniquity, every trespass I've done against you. You have forgiven and thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. Lord, today, be my Lord. Be my Master. Be my Savior. Take the throne room of my heart. From this day forward, I'm yours and I belong to you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We're just going to continue to pray. Luisha, this morning, I just pray right now for that little baby right now. For that baby, he's nine months. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. There is a destiny. There is a plan. There is a purpose. And I come against right now. Lord, I pray for the Spirit of God to come upon that little boy's body right now, that little baby's body right now, that Father God, in the name of Jesus, that Lord, that, op that operation, every single thing that, that is wrong there, that Lord, your sp the Spirit of the Lord would, would heal every single sickness, every ailment, every tissue, every blood cell in his body. We, yes, we speak it into being right now. We thank your word says that by your stripes, that child, that baby is healed. And I speak it over every single one of you watching this morning, right now, wherever you need healing in your body. Uh, just lay your hands right now. Lay your hands. You know, one of the things the Lord showed me this week, I just feel led to pray this. Some of you, the uh, Lord actually showed me this during the week, and I'm going to say it now again. I saw grinding of teeth. I saw grinding of teeth. People grinding their teeth. And because you've been grinding your teeth, not only has it caused dental issues, but it's causing neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, it's right down. back pain, all sorts. And I just want to declare right now, in the name of Jesus, that you will experience like so peaceful that you will peacefully sleep under the shadow of the Almighty. I declare that your spirit, soul and body will experience the shadow of the Almighty today. That you will experience the peace of God. I feel like there's some of you this morning who are also sitting watching right now that you needing God to be on the throne of your finances and your business. You, you've got big decisions to make this week concerning business, finances, um, paying certain debt or for I want to declare today, right now, in the name of Jesus, I lift that area, that, those finances up right now as you sow and as you give into the kingdom of God. I speak of your finances, the blessing, the blessing, the breakthrough anointing of God right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I don't know if there's, Michael, anything you felt led to. Just feeling weary at this moment. Father God, we pray for your strength, Father God. As your word says in Isaiah, Lord, 
my 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 they rise on rise on wings like eagles, Lord. This week in this weeks coming in this towards the end of the year, Father God, I pray that you will give us all a renewed strength, Father God. That when we wake up in the morning, when they wake up, Father God, they will wake up with a fire, Lord, yes. with a strength that cannot be understood because it will be through you and your power and your anointing, Father God. Let us get through this week to continue yes. running the race, even with yes. you. I feel like these yes. people that's been weary and been um, distant from God, and God wants you to come back. Don't fall away. Don't be weary right now. Come back to God. Yes. He's speaking yes. to you. He's calling you. He's been calling you, and He wants you to answer that call. So this morning, I pray that that as you hear this word, that if that is you, if you are that person that has been distant from God, that has been um, running away from the calling of God in your life, I pray that you will come into alignment with His word right now, yes, with His yes, purpose yes. and His plans for yes. you, that every plan that God has for you will come to pass in the name of Jesus. We come against every attack of the enemy yes, over the plans yes, the that God Jesus. has for you. We break oh, the attack of the enemy, the curse, any negative words spoken over over your plans and your future. We come against it, we tear it down right now and we send it to the pit of hell. The plans yes, of God will you, prevail God. for your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. and amen. Thanks, Michaela. <laughs> Listen, I too, just after this session, I'm looking so forward to next week, Sunday evening, 7 p.m. Absolutely. So, so bless you for all coming on. Um, please share this with others and we look forward to seeing you this evening, 7 p.m. service. And next week again for church, um, myself and Michaela are going to be live again the next week, uh, Sunday evening, 7 p.m. with some of the other youth leaders ministry, knuckles and prophesying. We look forward to seeing you there. God bless.